Hello everyone from Canada. Thank you to scientists for global responsibility for hosting this conference and inviting me. The problems of military missions and expenditures have certainly been forgotten and ignored by the international community in the lead up to the climate meeting in Paris next month. Last year I prepared a report for the International Peace Bureau entitled Demilitarization for Deep Decarbonization about the need to reduce militarism and military spending to tackle the climate crisis. I have been updating this report and will share with you several of the highlights. In my brief presentation today, I will discuss some of the important findings from the latest assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Then I will look more closely at the problems of military missions and expenditures. And I will conclude with some ideas about what we should do to confront and overcome these problems. You should also have a copy of a handout I prepared with references and further resources. This is a picture of a Boeing Stratotanker refueling an F-15 Strike Eagle fighter jet. These planes require a specialized fuel, JP-8, that is more carbon intensive and more refined with extra additives than the fuel used by commercial aircraft. The F-15 burns 14,400 gallons per hour. A U.S. Air Force study calculates that the fully burning cost for aerial refueling is $35 to $40 a gallon. That's $504,000 per hour. These are the fighter jets that the U.S. is using for its airstrikes over Syria and Iraq. According to U.S. Central Command, there have been almost 8,000 airstrikes in these countries since July 2014. Imagine for a moment the amount of fuel consumed, the cost of that fuel, and the greenhouse gases emitted. Canada, the UK, and France, who is hosting the climate meeting next month, are involved in this bombing campaign. But these countries are not accounting for the climate impacts, let alone the civilian impacts of their airstrikes. Let's consider these impacts in the context of the IPCC's fifth assessment report. The IPCC explains that humanity is on a dangerous business as usual path, continuing to increase greenhouse gases year after year. The scientists now warn that this path we are on will increase the likelihood of severe, pervasive and irreversible impacts. To change course, the international community must stay within a global carbon budget of 825 gigatons of CO2 over the next 35 years and achieve net zero emissions by 2050, which requires that 80 to 90% of the proven fossil fuel reserves must be left in the ground and countries must begin a rapid and radical decarbonization of their economies. This is the IPCC graph of the modeling based on the worst case scenario shown by the top black line. It is called representative concentration pathway 8.5. At our current level of carbon emissions, we are heading down this path toward a thousand parts per million volume of CO2 in the atmosphere and an increase of at least four degrees in global mean temperature by 2100. This is potentially catastrophic. To get off this path, the UN launched the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project. Technical and scientific experts have been brought together to help countries find zero carbon emission pathways to stay within the carbon budget to 2050. Plans have been created for all the major emitting countries, like the US, the UK, Canada, India, etc. The project describes deep decarbonization as a profound transformation of energy systems through steep declines in carbon intensity in all sectors of the economy. But they exclude the military. What this means essentially is that it will be energy austerity for every other sector but the military. Let's look more closely at the problem of military emissions. The U.S. Department of Defense, the DOD, is the largest institutional consumer of oil in the world, spending $17 billion a year. It is also the largest landholder, managing a global real property portfolio that consists of more than 562,000 facilities worldwide, covering almost 25 million acres. Of the petroleum products the military uses, 25% is for the stationary installations and 75% is for mobile operations. Military vehicles like tanks, warships, and fighter jets are notoriously energy inefficient and have long life cycles with locked-in energy platforms that are difficult to alter. 
The military is concerned about the costs of fuel, its energy security, the impacts on its installations, and the threat multiplier effect of climate change, but it is not concerned about its responsibility for the climate crisis. Let's look at how military emissions are accounted for or not by the IPCC. The IPCC established guidelines for countries to follow in the preparation of their annual greenhouse gas inventories and common reports, which are required by all parties to the UN Framework Convention every year. These are publicly available and you can find them on the IPCC website. Yet how military missions are accounted for remains incomplete and opaque. There are clauses for confidentiality, exemptions and allowances for aggregation. Military missions may be reported in the energy sector and are aggregated in the category Other lines 1A, 5A and B. Here are two instances of the confidentiality clauses in the guidelines allowed for the military. Due to confidentiality issues, many inventory compilers may have difficulty obtaining data for the quantity of fuel used by the military. And a minimum level of aggregation may be required to protect confidential business and military information. As well, military exemptions are also referred to in the latest report on U.S. emissions of greenhouse gases. The UN FCCC definition of energy consumption excludes international bunker fuels. Emissions from international bunker fuels are subtracted from the US total. Similarly, emissions from military bunker fuels are also subtracted from the US total. So why does the military get the special treatment? The former U.S. Undersecretary and lead negotiator for the American delegation during the Kyoto Protocol negotiations, Stuart Eisenstadt, stated in a Senate hearing in 1998, quote, We took special pains working with the Defense Department and with our uniformed military, both before and in Kyoto, to fully protect the unique position of the United States as the world's only superpower with global military responsibilities. We achieved everything they outlined as necessary to protect military operations and our national security. At Kyoto, the parties, for example, took a decision to exempt key overseas military activities from any emissions targets including exemptions for bunker fuels used in international aviation and maritime transport and from emissions resulting from multilateral operations. The militaries of all countries take advantage of these exemptions. This is the webpage of National Greenhouse Gas Inventories and Common Reports submitted to the IPCC. Let's look at the UK's latest GHG Inventory and Common Report. When you look for military missions in section 1A, 5A and B, there are few numbers, but instead notations, IE and NO, which means included elsewhere and not occurring. This tells us little about the amount of British stationary military missions. For mobile military fuel use, the CO2 is estimated at 2,522 gigagrams, which is about a tenth of commercial carbon emissions. Overall, from my study of these inventories and reports from many different countries, I have found that the confidentiality and exclusion exemptions hide the full climate impacts of the military. As I mentioned earlier, mitigating climate change is not a priority for the military. This is obvious in the, the British Ministry of Defense's latest annual report and account to Parliament. Climate change is mentioned merely twice in passing in a 200-page document whereas weapons and munitions are mentioned 42 times and fuel is mentioned 47 times. The MOD estimated fuel costs for the period 2014 to 2015 to be 550 million pounds. This is the most spending on fuel of any other government department. The MOD is also one of the largest landholders in the UK. There is no doubt it has a large carbon bootprint at home and abroad. Militaries are trying to reduce their fuel consumption and costs, but not because they are concerned about climate change. They are concerned about maintaining their operational tempo. This is evidenced by the U.S. Defense Sciences Board's 2008 report entitled, entitled More Fight, Less Fuel, and by the U.S. Department of Defense's first operational energy strategy entitled Energy for the Warfighter. 
The department is working to make warfighting more energy efficient, yet the Defense Logistics Agency projects a continued and steady increase in the use of petroleum products by the military over the next two decades. Let's think of military missions and expenditures in the context of the new Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, announced at the UN last month. There are 17 global priorities. Number one is no poverty. Number seven is affordable and clean energy for everyone. And number 13 is climate action. The UN estimates that it will require a three to five trillion dollar a year investment to achieve the SDGs by 2030. The International Energy Agency estimates that one trillion a year for the next 40 years is needed to decarbonize the global economy. As well, the UN Green Climate Fund needs $100 billion a year to help developing countries adapt to climate change. Yet the wealthy Western countries most responsible for this environmental crisis are not pledging adequate funds for the SDGs or for the Climate Fund. In July, the UN hosted a meeting on financing for development in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to determine how the SDGs will be funded. But the outcome document did not mention military spending. Yet the Norway Forum on Development and Environment made a formal submission to the finance meeting to reallocate military spending to social and environmental pro priorities, but this proposal was ignored. Instead, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda focuses on tax reform and raising private funds. Many NGOs have called this outcome a failure. Yet, as you know, global annual military spending is $1.7 trillion as estimated by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. This is money that could be used to meet our social and environmental needs. This is CIPRI's graph of global military spending over the past 25 years. This is CIPRI's ranking of highest military spenders. The US is first spending over $600 billion a year on defense. The UK is sixth at 60 billion US dollars. The US spends more than almost all other top ranking spenders combined. Many of you already know this. But what you might not know is that the US Department of Defense has not been audited in 20 years. The American Government Accountability Office, the GAO, has not been able to conduct an audit of DOD's books and has kept the department on its high-risk list. The GAO says the department is at a high risk for fraud, waste, and financial abuse. For me, this makes circumspect all reporting by the DOD, including for its fuel costs and consumption. I suspect things are even worse than they appear. Though the books of the British Ministry of Defense are audited, the Cameron government funds and prioritizes its military more than its environmental programs. Let's compare and contrast the budgets for the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, the Department of Energy and Climate Change, and the Ministry of Defense. These are the figures from the latest national accounts. DEFRA gets 2.8 billion pounds every year, DEC gets 11 billion, and the MOD gets 37 billion pounds. The British government spends too little on the environment and too much on the military. Worse, Prime Minister Cameron recently announced that the UK will commit 2% of its GDP for defence, meeting the NATO target. The government has also committed to purchase the F-35s. This new Lockheed Martin fighter jet is the most expensive weapons system in history, estimated at $1 trillion. The F-35 is a fifth-generation stealth fighter with a single engine that has an internal fuel capacity of 18,200 pounds with a combat radius of less than 590 nautical air miles. This is highly inefficient at 31 pounds of fuel per nautical mile. These fighter jets are also plagued by protracted technical problems and cost overruns. Furthermore, the F-35s will not address the real threats like flooding and air pollution that the UK is facing. In conclusion, I think that the international community needs to confront and un answer some fundamental questions. How much of the carbon budget will be allocated to the military? How much of the remaining fossil fuels are we going to allow the military to use? And for what purposes? Warfighting? Why are military missions not on the COP agenda? And why are military expenditures not considered for climate and sustainability financing? Why is there limited independent research on the military's impacts on the climate and environment? And what are we going to do about all of this? 
I believe we need disarmament along with climate mitigation and adaptation. With the urgency and gravity of global warming, we cannot waste any more oil or any more money on war. Last year in September, I was at the huge historic People's March in New York. There were many people carrying signs like these, windmills, not weapons. This past March in London, I was at the Campaign Against the Arms Trade Conference and was really impressed with their new publication, Arms to Renewables. CAT shows how this transition to a cleaner, greener, peaceful economy, economy could be possible. Finally, I invite you all to the International Peace Bureau's meeting in Berlin in September 2016. It will be a major conference on addressing the problem of military spending and militarism. More information is on the website www.ipb2016.berlin. I hope to see you there. Thank you.